Hello and welcome to BQ Prime. Today I'm in conversation with Sonal Varma from Namura. Sonal, hi. Thank you so very much for taking time out for us. Thank you very much for having me. So uh, to begin with, I would want to start off by asking you about what you're making of the Indian economy at the current juncture. Uh, you've just given uh, an interesting presentation where you said that broadly, while things are looking up, uh, growth in India does need to be broad based. And from a nearer term perspective, we have seen rural economy indicators continue to show a mixed performance ever since the pandemic. That's right. So I think, uh, I mean, currently headline and aggregate growth indicators are still looking uh, quite strong. So uh, some of the high frequency numbers on consumption investment uh, still suggest that growth uh, remains solid in the ongoing quarter. Uh, I think the question is more in terms of uh, the sustainability of this trend, particularly as we look out into FI25 uh, for India. Uh, and there, there are uh, challenges uh, that India faces. One is, of course, the uh, external uh, sector where, you know, Nomura's house view is we are likely to enter a synchronized global downturn and 2024 will be a challenging year for global growth. So that will have uh, some spillovers uh, for uh, India. Uh, and second is just in terms of the drivers of our own uh, demand. Uh, as you mentioned, I mean, rural uh, consumption still remains quite soft. Uh, and uh, given the uh, monsoon situation that we've seen in the Kharif, uh, plus uh, risks around uh, Rabi, uh, we do think uh, rural consumption will be uh, on the tepid side. Uh, and similarly, on the private capex uh, front, uh, things are too uncertain uh, at this stage and therefore the delays we've seen in private investment uh, might continue. So uh, on the whole, uh, growth is holding up right now. Uh, we think uh, growth will be closer to 6% this financial year, uh, but given the external challenges and some of the unevenness in domestic recovery, FI25 does look like uh, a challenging year, which is where we think there's going to be a growth slowdown. Okay, uh, can you elaborate a little bit more on like, you know, Nomura does forecast a mild recession in the US uh, in the next fiscal. Uh, India is already beginning to see a little bit of the impact of a global slowdown. We have seen merchandise uh, trade at significantly lower levels than we were seeing during the pandemic. What else? What else is the impact expected to be next year? And which parts of the economy are expected to be hit further? Uh, so I think one interesting thing about this particular cycle is that cycles are very desynchronized. Uh, so we've seen a good sector slow down, but the services sector globally actually uh, have uh, held up uh, fairly well. So it's sort of being like a rolling recession. So for instance, the merchandise export slowdown uh, is something that we've seen uh, in rest of Asia as well because of the good cycle slowdown. Uh, and that partly happened because initially when the economies reopened, you saw this move in demand from goods to services uh, and high inflation typically also tends to negatively impact uh, consumer demand for discretionary goods. So we've seen a slowdown in the goods sector and India's merchandise exports, uh, but as that's got nothing to do with uh, you know, the mild recession that uh, we are expecting uh, in the US. Uh, similarly, the softness we've seen in the IT sector essentially reflects the tightening and discretionary spending in that some of the banking finance uh, and retail verticals have done in US and uh, Europe. But the services sector and the labor market uh, have remained uh, quite resilient. Now, going forward, uh, our view is that the tighter bank lending standards that uh, are already in play in US will spill over on the business investment side. Uh, and uh, the labor market, which is resilient, uh, will also soften uh, into 2024. So we are expecting the unemployment rate to inch higher uh, next year. So I think from India's perspective, therefore, um, it's uh, but not just exports, uh, but uh, importantly, the investment uh, component, because uh, the investment cycles in India are closely correlated to the global uh, growth cycles and investment, particularly public investment has been quite resilient. So I think uh, we could potentially see a moderation uh, in that component of growth going forward. 
All right. So, you know, uh, in some of your notes, uh, as well as in your presentation, you did uh, touch upon the rising fiscal defense of uh, food inflation by the Indian government. Uh, you essentially made the point that uh, if India is to stick to its fiscal deficit target, then the government, which has been actively intervening, we have seen a slew of supply side interventions to keep multiple food commodity prices in check. Uh, that will either have to be funded from a slowdown in CAPEX or a diversion of savings from other schemes. So tell us a little bit more about how you expect that to play out. And also, what's your outlook on some of these commodities where we have seen slightly stickier inflation? Right. Um, so on the fiscal side, I think uh, so far, uh, you know, we have, as you said, seen some sort of uh, fiscal intervention uh, from the government. We are also getting into the election cycle, uh, so that will be important. Uh, so for instance, the free food grain scheme, which ends uh, this December, our view is that's going to be extended by three to six months, and that's pretty sizable in terms of the additional food subsidy uh, that uh, that will uh, entail. Uh, and oil prices right now, uh, retail prices have been unchanged, but uh, oil marketing companies have seen their under recoveries uh, move higher. So if we do see a sustained uh, increase in oil prices, uh, our view is uh, the government will have to provide some sort of a fiscal support. It will be quite difficult to uh, increase uh, retail fuel prices, uh, you know, given consumers are under stress and we are headed into the election cycle. So. Yes, there are these additional fiscal pressures that are lining up uh, on the subsidy uh, side uh, for India. Now, so far, the government has front-loaded uh, its uh, CAPEX spending. It's also front-loaded the uh, support it has given to states in terms of their CAPEX spending. And that seems to be uh, supported by the tax collections, uh, you know, thus far. Uh, but as we look forward and as some of the subsidy commitments come through, um, you know, a choice will need to be made in terms of uh, either sticking to the 5.9% target or, you know, compromising on something. Uh, bulk of the revenue expenditure is quite sticky in nature. Uh, and therefore, the, you know, discretionary spending that can be adjusted ultimately ends up being CAPEX. So, which is why we think that, you know, fiscal deficit targets can be met. Uh, but it will come at the cost of some uh, growth because it's been government that's been driving a lot of the public capex growth. Sure. So, you know, all in all, from what I understand, there is a possibility that we will see slightly slower public uh, spending, uh, especially uh, what we have seen on uh, the uh, CAPEX front, the infrastructure front, uh, that along with a global slowdown. Uh, but at the same time, with, uh, you know, uh, once we are done with India's general elections, there is an expectation that uh, that will be one thing less that uh, answer. Uh, uncertainty that's currently prevailing will be one thing less for private players uh, uh, to worry about. So net net can we how do we expect the uh, capex outlook to play out? Right. From a slightly longer term perspective. Right. Um, so I think uh, you know there are, uh, from a longer term perspective uh, capex should rebound. Um, you know the big challenge of the last uh, decade has really been the twin balance sheet problems and we've dealt with both the corporate and the banking balance sheet. So, you know, the supply side is in a good place and essentially we need the demand side components to uh, kick in. Now, when we look at the three components of uh, CAPEX, you have the uh, real estate side, manufacturing and the infra pie. Uh, the infra pie has been driven largely by the government. We will need to see some of that continue, but essentially private sector also playing a bigger role in terms of driving the uh, public capex. Um, the uh, housing side, uh, where actually the last decade has also been quite challenging for the real estate uh, players. Fundamentally, they are in a stronger position. Uh, and um, while we've seen interest rates move up, uh, I won't say they are, you know, extremely restrictive. Uh, and therefore, for the housing uh, segments to see uh, some increase in terms of, uh, you know, investment going forward, I think is quite uh, feasible. And we could see a lot of this play out in some of the tier two, tier three cities, uh, you know, as they uh, develop. Uh, the manufacturing component, some of this is sensitive to global demand conditions uh, and domestic uh, demand recovery. 
as that stabilizes and capacity utilization moves closer to 80 percent that should be a push factor uh, plus the supply chains that are sort of moving to India we do think is a three to five year uh, opportunity um, currently you've seen a lot of the mobile phone manufacturing companies sort of set up shop uh, in India it's not moving the capex needle uh, as of now uh, but once this becomes sort of more broad based then the manufacturing side can also uh, kick in so it's possible it's going to be a multiple uh, you know uh, year process uh, but more infra and uh, housing led initially and then manufacturing catching up uh, over time and uh, in terms of where we are with uh, the central bank and the uh, benchmark repo rate, uh, while you do expect a status quo for the rest of this fiscal, as to most of us, uh, the next fiscal we do expect, uh, you know, uh, easier conditions uh, in terms of monetary conditions as well? Uh, that's our baseline. And um, I mean, for India, the two... Um, I mean, there are two positive aspects. One is that the underlying inflation has come down and that is a very big positive. So core metrics, uh, you know, on a year over year basis is down to four and a half percent. But if you look at the three month sequential momentum, that's actually below four uh, percent in India, uh, which is uh, suggesting that underlying uh, conditions are very much in uh, check. Uh, and uh, the household inflation expectations, which the RBI came out with uh, recently, very surprising that they've fallen to single digits for the first time since the pandemic, because inflation expectations in India are adaptive. Uh, and they are very influenced by food prices. So you had higher inflation, you had higher food prices, but still expectations went down. So that's telling us that underlying shocks are, underlying inflation is very much in check. Yes, there are risks from uh, oil and food, which we are sort of firewalling right now by not passing it on to uh, retail. Uh, and therefore the forward-looking inflation outlook uh, looks positive. So we think, uh, uh, one, the core inflation will remain uh, around four and a half uh, percent. It might even go below four and a half percent uh, over the next 12 months. Uh, and for FI25, uh, on average, we have also inflation closer to four, four and a half uh, percent. So the RBI's sort of one year forward real policy rate, therefore, will be closer to two percent. So if the synchronized global growth downturn view uh, does play out, which is what we think uh, is uh, most likely, then between growth and inflation, we think it will call for uh, growth uh, support. So um, our base case is uh, the policy easing. I mean, we are in an extended hold period right now. Um, you know, let's be clear about that. Uh, but once the growth uh, dynamic starts to uh, shift a gear down, uh, yes, we think the central bank uh, will move to easing from April next year. All right. So before I let you go, one last question. Your presentation did have a catchy a tagline, R EMs, the new DMs. Uh, so you tell me, uh, India does appear to be well placed, like you said, even among its Asian peers. Uh, so what are your thoughts? How would you answer that question yourself if you had to? I mean, typically, you know, when one thinks about EMs, uh, the standard uh, template is it's a high, highly volatile uh, asset class, um, you know, imprudent macro policies, whereas what we've seen is actually just the opposite. Um, you know, interest rate movements, for instance, in uh, a lot of EMs, including in India, uh, have been a lot contained than the daily volatility we are seeing in uh, US uh, fixed income uh, markets. Um, both monetary and fiscal response in India, for instance, uh, was a lot more contained uh, than the kind of expansion uh, DMs did, uh, and which was one reason why inflation shot through the roof, uh, and we don't have uh, that kind of an inflation problem. But I think importantly, in terms of uh, the kind of reforms that we are putting in place, uh, so in terms of, you know, uh, setting the right ease of doing business, push on public capex. So I think we're focusing on the right things in terms of getting medium term growth uh, and policy making is uh, prudent. So to that extent, uh, it's not the erstwhile uh, EM people typically uh, have in mind and therefore uh, the provocative question mark of is EM the new DM. Great. That's a great note to end on. Thank you so much for taking time out for us. Thank you very much.